el Instituto Milenio para la Investigación en Depresión y Personalidad, el MIDAP, les da a todas y por supuesto a todos los presentes la más cordial de las bienvenidas a esta que es la ceremonia de lanzamiento, una instancia que dará inicio de manera ya oficial a uno de los dos primeros institutos científicos en ciencias sociales financiados por el programa Iniciativa Científica Milenio del Ministerio de Economía, Fomento y Turismo. Agradecemos la presencia de, de las autoridades, en especial de Mauricio Gómez, jefe del Departamento de Salud Mental de la Subsecretaría de Salud Pública del Ministerio de Salud. También saludamos, por supuesto, a los rectores, a los vicerrectores y directores de investigación, a los decanos, directores de escuelas y departamentos e investigadores de las cinco universidades que albergan al Instituto Milenio para la Investigación en Depresión y Personalidad. También le damos un muy cordial saludo a los directores de los Centros Científicos de Excelencia, los representantes de los centros asistenciales, profesionales de la salud y la salud mental, los investigadores del MIDAP, profesores y estudiantes participantes del primer taller latinoamericano sobre investigación. workshop on research on depression, personality and all the audience. Many people here. Bueno, el Instituto Milenio para well, the Millennium Institute for Research on Depression and Personality, MIDAP, is a scientific center hosted on five universities. The Catholic University of Chile, which is today the home uh, honor in this kickoff uh, ceremony, University of Chile, the University El Desarrollo de La Frontera University, and the Valparaiso University. MIDAP is comprised on its core by psychologists, psychiatrists, and professionals from several areas of social sciences, as well as from health, who are generating knowledge mainly based on a multidimensional understanding of depression and interaction with personality, everything of course with the purpose of maximizing the effectiveness of intervention through identification of agents and change mechanisms involved in prevention, psychotherapy and re I want to leave the floor to Professor Marianne Cross, she is Director of the Millennium Institutes for Research on Depression and Personality Meetup. Marianne, please, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Mrs. Virginia Garreton, director of the Millennium Scientific Initiative. Dr. Mauricio Gomez, chief of the Department of Mental Health of the, and the Secretary of Public Health of the Ministry of Health. Mr. Federico Valdez, principal of the Desarrollo University. Mr. Walter Eckel, director of Heidelberg Center for Latin America. Mrs. Maria Elena Boissier, director of research of the University, Catholic University of Chile. Mrs. Silvia Nunez, research director of the Chile University. Mr. Mr. Ricardo Herrera, coordinator of the performance agreement of the La Frontera University. Mr. Adrián Palacio, director of research from the Valparaiso University. Mrs. Marise Anjan, research director from the Desarrollo University. Researchers, invited researchers, Dr. Denis de Fey from the University of La Republica and the Center of Psychoanalytic Focalytic Interventions from Uruguay, Dr. Peter Fonagy from the University College of London, Dr. Adam Horvat from the Simon Fraser University from Canada. Dr. Andres Rousseau from the University of Buenos Aires, deans, principals of the schools and departments, and researchers from the five universities hosting the Millennium Institute for Research on Depression and Personality. Directors of scientific, excellent scientific centers, representatives of assistance uh, uh, caregiving uh, centers, professionals of health and mental health, researchers from IDAB, and graduate students, and national and Latin American students, colleagues, and dear friends. It is a pleasure to give you the warmest welcome to this celebration. 
our Millennium Institute for the Investigation on Depression and Personality, MIDAP, was born in a special year for Chilean science. This is a year of waking up where the political will in order to do changes has been aligned with the public expression of the poverty conditions of our country regarding the investment on science and technology. From the governmental authority, the co it was called the expertise of scientific and political players in order to create a new institutional framework for science in Chile. And on scientists, it was deployed an awareness, a comprehensive awareness of the importance science has for the development of the country. But at the same time, of the lack of resources available in order to achieve this task. This is the national context receiving MIDAP as a research center, printing into the new institute from its very beginning the awareness that we are not only advocated to science, but we are at service of the country in a scenario of a scarcity of resources for scientific research, such as the Chilean scenario today, the duty is double. Our responsibility, our particular responsibility as one of the first two millennium institutes of social sciences in Chile is making a significant contribution both for sciences as well as for well-being of population of our country. Aligned with this understanding of our mission, the MIDAP Institute combines basic and applied research, including technological transfer. Our basic research is focused on the genesis of mental health problems, in particular depression and personality disorders. Through our applied research, we assess preventive and curative interventions existing in the country. But at the same time, we transfer our knowledge, developing new technologies for intervention, assessing their effectiveness and putting them in place in the assistance scope. Today we are here asked to celebrate the kicking off of this new research center, MIDAP, where the Chilean state has invested resources to research for 10 years about a epidemiological relevance problem. We are very thankful about the confidence that means having resources for research for such a long time and in particular that this investment goes in benefit of the mental health of Chileans. This country, unfortunately, we have high indexes of depression which are related to psychosocial, cultural, and even biological features which are proper of our context. In consequence, they need scientific, national scientific research. Even though we have started working officially as a Millennium Institute, this year, 2015, our trajectory as a research team is quite longer. By early 2000s, we were given birth to a line of investigation on processes of psychotherapeutic changes that we keep up to date and that was, uh, uh, became one of the four core lines of research of MIDAP. This research line was also materialized on a PhD program created about 10 years ago, sustained by two of our current hosting universities. I mentioned this PhD program not only because the research team that created it coincides with one of the MIDAP research team, but also because this experience has taught us that inter-university collaboration is possible and it's very enriching. Continuing with the, with the story of our history, about five years we decided to enhance our research line. By that time, purely psychological, we exploited to other disciplines. We form a millennium code where we developed research that included psychological, physiological, and social dimensions for study on depression. 
Nevertheless, during our work as a nucleus, we discovered these three dimensions didn't cover the whole phenomenon as to encompass it as a comprehensive phenomenon. It was necessary to include other biological aspects besides the physiological aspects. We had to include the culture and the evolutive dimension, namely the specificities of each age group. Additionally, we discovered the interaction between personality styles, vulnerability to depression, and differential response to treatments. On this uh, result base previous uh, it was constituted the current multidimensional approach of MIDAP, which understands depression on interaction with personality and influenced by cultural, social, cognitive, emotional, con uh, behavioral, psychophysiological, and genetical aspects. All these from an evolutive perspective, namely understanding that this disorder, as well as other mental health problems, is, are built along life in interaction with the different environments that the person is involved. In this story that I have summarized uh, and that has taken us to the place we are today, celebrating the inauguration of Midab, there are many people we have to thanks to. To thank to. At the first instance, I would like to thank the universities hosting us. The universities make possible researchers to advocate to research. Our hosting universities, and I will name them according to the amount of researchers participating in MIDAP, are the Catholic University, the Chile University, the Desarrollo University, the La Frontera University, and the Valparaiso University. Associate researchers and attach uh, researchers from MIDAP who are scholars from these universities, we advocate an important part of our day to research. Uh, our universities, through this uh, support, are making our scientific task possible. But it is also true that without the particular commitment of researchers, we wouldn't make our research uh, um, task. Therefore, I would like to personally thank each of them. Likewise, it is, not, it is also true that the scientific work of MIDAP is sustained by an important amount of young scientific uh, who are working on their PhD thesis or post-PhD thesis or they have a wage-based uh, uh, work in the quality of young researchers. I want to express my particular thank to all of them. And I want to state that I think it is crucial that the development of science in Chile also implies providing them of a more stable working context with better salaries and further projections for their research careers. On the other hand, a Millennium Institute is not sustained without an important investment on management uh, tasks. MIDAP has a management structures with specialized uh, professional positions, thanks to the daily work of our directors uh, of research of management and development, uh, uh, communication and extension, and finance director, and um, from our uh, direction assistant, scientific uh, people could invest the most time possible on research. I would like to express a special acknowledgement to researchers comprising the Council of Associate Researchers of MIDAP. This council has the responsibility of defining and redefining our goals, uh, developing development plan, establishing assessment procedures for our work, critically analyzing our weaknesses and uh, strengths, and observing the context uh, conditions. MIDAP works in collaboration with different institutions from the school scope, labor scope, and health scope. In these scopes, we perform the transfer of our research into the environment, whether in the format of an initiative of promotion of mental health, prevention of depression, or on new treatment strategies. I would like to thank all the institutions, both private and public, 
who we are establish collaboration agreements with. And, of course, I would like to express my gratitude to the Chilean state represented by the Ministry of Economy and, in particular, the Millennium Scientific Initiative for supporting us with so valuable resources for research. We will work towards for this to be an investment contributing to the development of our country. Thank you very much, all of you, for attending today, celebrating with us. So we want to thank the words from Marianne Krauss, as director of the Millennium Institute for Research on Depression and Personality. I would like to invite to this stage the executive director of the program Millennium Scientific Initiative from the Ministry of Economy and Tourism, Mrs. Virginia Garreton. Virginia, please. Hola. Hello. Good afternoon or evening. Well, we are in very moving, moving moments for science in the country. It's always hard to be in the public world in these circumstances. But I don't want to talk about trouble. I want to talk about positive things. I'm going to bring this light down. It's bothering. I see a lot of young people, so what I want to do is to tell you what's millennium. What, why we are gathered here to celebrate the opening of a millennium institute. Uh, I don't know if you know that Chile finances research institute like millennium, and there are some other programs. In the case of millennium, there are 36 centers across the country in which nine are institutes and 27 are cores. Cores are smaller groups, like around 70 researchers, but institutes are around 200, 200 researchers, from students up to the oldest ones. It's a lot of people. In Chile, we are little researchers. We are few. We have counted 6,000. That's really few. But in a center, there are many researchers. And why we created these centers? Why? You may wonder why a country that has little money on science, they invest in centers. And why not better to invest in more funds? That is, individual research. We would reach more people with that? With Pondesit, should we have more resources as a country with that? Well, it turns out that research centers, it's proven in the world, but we've also proved it in Chile. It has a lot of externalities that are positive that, that do not only have to do with the research. And there's a couple that I really like that they're involved with these centers, is that centers, instead of wondering on focusing on one question, they focus on answering to a problem, on looking at a problem. And they are the natural place for gathering people from different areas. Because when you apply for a, a fund, of, how many of you have funds in this room? Okay, there are. The ones that have funds, you know you make a question, and the researcher answers it with some thesis. When a group of scientists from different universities, from different places of the country, from different faculties of a university, they gather to make a millennia institute, they have to find a problem worth it, a problem that is important for the country because they will have to compete with other 100 proposals and only two will be approved. That is the approval rate of a millennia institute, two among 100. And I'm telling you this because it means that here we have one out of two of social sciences that was worth it to finance, that somebody important in the world because the evaluators are international and the state does not intervene on who to choose, said it was worth it to finance this institute over another. And it said that because in this center was not only research, quality research done before, but because the proposal that we were supposed to do in the following 10 years was something worth financing because the view was multidisciplinary. The amount of people that they, we were training was 
profitable or it has a meaning for the country. And because of the question that we, they were going to answer or the problem that they were going to focus on, it was worth it. So what I want to say is not just opening a center, especially when the country is not investing on science that much. Maybe we're not opening that many these years, but we are opening this one, and we're opening one to last for 10 years, and it's going to last for 10 years. And we have a really huge hope, Marianne, because you, with the other institutes, are the first on social science. We have all the hope on you proving that it's worth it to invest more in social sciences, because Millennium started investing on natural sciences and exact sciences. And this institute is one of the two that started a change in the view, where they say, why is not social sciences? Now, it's true that this institute is a bit social sciences and biomedical science. It's a bit of everything, but that's the, the appeal of it. And what I want to convey is that you have an obligation with every Chilean person, because we are all expecting you to help us to have a, a view on depression, on health, or mental health problems in Chile that why am I going to say figures, you know them better than me. Another thing I wanted to say, another idea, is that I see a lot of young researchers and scientists I've been gathering, meeting a lot of them, and given the discussion that we have about financing of science, the scientific institutionality, it seems the horizon is dark, but we, and that we are in a situation where it's not worth it to dedicate to science. Let me tell you something from my scientific point of view. It's always worth it to dedicate to science. You're always going to have a good time with science. There may be little money like this, like now. But do not look at the picture, look at the movie. In this moment, we are discussing about a country. We are discussing a country to have a better education, to improve productivity, but we're also discussing in the country to have more science and to have better science. And you're starting the road, and it's worth it to, to walk with do not get down now. In five year, more years, the country will have better science and it will be investing more. And in this path, is really good because you'll have a good time and it creates meaning. And I wanted to say the last idea, which is scientific and the Millennium Institute, we expect them, we, they have a role in society that is beyond the science they do. For example, Mariani was a member of the Presidential Commission that created the proposal of institutionality for science that the President received in June. What do I want to say with this? When scientific become a part of these groups of scientists, they start becoming an elite becoming part of an elite and lead of people that build the country, that are part of the boards that think about what the country will do. That's what you are, Marianne, now. So you have a responsibility. The ones that are in the center, the ones that are on other centers, the ones doing science and having space to open, to comment, which is let's build the country we want. All of us, the country is not built by just one president, it's built by all the citizens, and we have a responsibility that it doesn't lay on just them, but on everybody. And we have one last responsibility, and here I'm closing, and that is to convince the rest of Chile, not only the government, not only the internal affairs, is that science is worth it, because science has little financing, because Chilean people have not put science as a priority, because at the end, the country distributes the, the funding on the priorities of the country. And we haven't put science on a, on a better place. So we have a role to, to fulfill, and it's hard for a person that is not scientific. Why is science? It's worth it. Because it's in a context, science is in a context that requires somebody that is doing it to explain properly why it's worth it. So scientifics, it's us the ones that we should explain it, and it's all of you that are sitting here doing science, you are part of these responsibilities. Now I invite you that from now on when you leave to everybody you bump into, we have make a national campaign on saying why science is worth it. Think of this question, what would happen to the country if it did not finance anything about science and if all the scientific of any, this country, of any area, they were 
going to leave to Argentina. I want you to think about it and look for the answer for you to have it for the next person who answers. Thank you very much. I want to thank Virginia Garretton, Executive Director of the Scientific Initiative Millennium Program from the Ministry of Economy and Tourism, who has given her the vision of the state on science, at least in a small part. While continuing with this ceremony, I want to, want to invite you to watch an institutional video from the Millennium Institute that accounts for the research labor developed there and the daily work many researchers, many scientists do. MIDAP es el Instituto Milenio para la Investigación en Depresión y Personalidad. Es un centro de investigación de los centros de excelencia que tiene el país. Tiene financiamiento de la Iniciativa Científica Milenio. Milenio Científica está por un número bastante importante de investigadores. Somos aproximadamente 150 personas. Estamos investigando sobre depresión y personalidad desde múltiples ámbitos, desde la perspectiva espiritual biológica, epigenética, psicológica, social y cultural. Nuestra misión es aportar conocimiento científico válido para intervenir tanto preventivamente como en términos preventivos de tratamiento frente a los trastornos de depresión y de los trastornos de depresión. El inicio de Milenio es un proyecto de Milenio que conecta a la comunidad científica y pública proyectos de la comunidad científica We want you to focus on research to be relevant for the policy design, having further knowledge on how life context of people impact on their mental health, to have knowledge on which are the best interventions as to respond to mental health problems population have. The scope of depression. Depression is a very heterogeneous disorder. It comes from, let's say, a exaggerated reaction to pass away of relative up to a very disabilitating uh, disorder. There are several diseases within that syndrome. We may say we are among the countries with the highest depression rates. If we, at the same time, look at Santiago, we are among the capital cities with the highest depression rates. We, if we look at the the rate uh, levels of uh, depression uh, compared to the income level, it happens in the lowest income level. Everything comprises a new scenario that indicates that depression is not uh, only biological, not psychological phenomenon, but it is a cultural and social phenomenon too. Changes in relation, significant relation from the emotional loss up to complex uh, difficulties on maintaining relationships, these are the items that we know are critical at the beginning of mental disorders such as depression. Depression in the early childhood is completely invisible. It's hard looking at a child and imagine he or she has depression. It doesn't mean he or she doesn't have it. We may detect early symptoms of depression that are related to the lack of link with adults. The work we've done in the early childhood unit is critical. Then we have training with our team at national level psychologists and social assistants were trained by this unit and then transferred to different teams from uh, kindergartens were uh, made, encompassing all the traditional kindergartens, training directors, principals, and educators of early childhood. In order to say that somebody has depression, you have to say they are intense symptoms for more than two weeks. Many times when they give to consultation, they have a very uh, hopeless uh, uh, lack of mood for one month, along with symptoms such as problems of sleeping and problems of appetite and feeding problems. Teenager suicide is relatively high in our continent. We may say it's at least double prevalence compared to the rest of Latin America. Each day, one teenager dies.
by suicide, by committing suicide in Chile in the last few years. We've been with the top team of the Institute going to different cities in Chile, sharing with different teachers, and we think this is one of the basic means for prevention and early intervention of depression. There are several risk factors causing depression in the other people, or it may cause. For instance, there's age-related issues such as retirement, loss of close contacts, the loss of relatives, social isolation is one of the most important factors on the development of symptoms of depression. At the end of the day, taking into account that elder people are an age group that still require and need uh, attention, but not only from the, the treatment standpoint, but on the country, considering 8% of them are self uh, as independent people. We previously were a millennium core that worked on this interaction, and part of this result was finding out that it depends on the kind of personality somebody has, the propension to develop depression, sensitiveness to stress, for instance, and also effectiveness of interventions. This millennium core was started working with the black model that defines two styles of personalities and two styles of getting depressed, which is analytical styles, which are more or less independent profiles, and introjective styles, which are more, more self-critical styles. For instance, we found out that styles had a different brain reactivity, a different uh, reaction to stress, and that put us in a situation of offering a much more specific treatment, which is some sort of tailor-made psychotherapy for the patient, scientifically based. We are mainly interested in focusing and studying verbal and non-verbal aspects of that interaction in the exchange between therapist and patient through the psychotherapeutic process. Silvia is trying to find out brain signals that correspond to particular moments of the therapy, brain markers that determine that there's a relevant note to show on which moment of the therapy there are particular communication processes or moments the therapy is particularly well and there's a good adjustment to communication of therapist and patient or moments with breakings or blockages on communication. We may design therapies more appropriate to produce that change in a faster way. On the other hand, we may train therapists for do this in a better manner. This coordination, this dialogue between two disciplines such as psychotherapy and neurosciences, I think we are being witnesses of one of the first examples of this, and I think so far it is very beneficial. makes reference to the use of technology for prevention or promotion or treatment in the area of mental health. It consists on developing a tool, a web platform, in order to support treatment of patients who have a post-traumatic stress condition. What we want with this tool is being able to cover the demand of the needs of the set of uh, patients who are very isolated in geographical terms, for instance, in the northern areas, in the southern areas, in Chile Chico, in the salmon producer areas, in places where mining companies are at very very high height, and people cannot go down for the regular control. So yeah, it's with this tool, supporting them to have a link with them and a therapeutic link with their treatment. And this daily contact with researchers, uh, participation on congresses, uh, the joint participation on writing scientific papers, all those things give you the possibility of keeping on growing on this uh, task of generating knowledge, scientific knowledge. A good research is made that way. It's not made one person in one single space, but generating teams such as the ones we have here. I might be one of the most senior researchers in the media, so my task is training new researchers who, at the end of the day, will continue the task we all have started. The fact that we've been talking together, physicians, psychologists, anthropologists, sociologists, on a common topic is very enriching. 
the meetup team is like breathing enthusiasm towards giving, delivering the knowledge we are developing, we are researching, we understand our mission goes beyond the part of generation knowledge. We have to generate applicable knowledge in the service the country, but at the same time it is not only local but also have worldwide relevance. Big, big applause for all workers from Midap. There we could see the daily work, but of course you have many other tasks according to what we have heard with the people who have come to the stage. I want to invite to this stage Dr. Mauricio Gomez, the Chief of the Mental Health Department of the Undersecretary of Public Health of the Ministry of Health. We saw him on video giving some words, but now he's going to give a more comprehensive and deeper discourse. Everything I was going to say was said on the video. I'm going to focus on the person of Marian Kraus, my greeting, uh, all the initiatives. I don't know the name of all of you, but his greeting representatives from the universities, researchers, uh, Ministry of Economy. Because uh, this initiative is really ve quite relevant. And I came here in double representation of the Department of uh, Mental Health, on first place, the Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Carmen Castillo, who was very interested in being here, but actually, because of her position under these circumstances in this moment, she couldn't be here today. And she expressly asked me to give you a warm greeting and uh, her joy because of this event. I feel a little bit ashamed of talking on behalf of something important, facing a lot of important people, and being a person who have all his life worked on the backstage of mental health and psychiatry, psychiatric hospitals and community centers. There's an experience behind that that in a moment took me to have a responsibility position such as the one I have today, where I have learned a lot because it opens uh, it opens uh, the spectrum, uh, the vision from the microscope, you move to the telescope and you are permanently changing the scope in the standpoint of the mental health. I have, uh, I have a feeling that, hopefully I'm not wrong, that we are in a moment, a few stars, a few planets are being aligned. Marianne, I think, saw, uh, said something similar. I belong to a generation that we've been for many years, uh, since early the 80s and early the 90s to early the 90s on this issue of mental health, and uh, many changes have been built, uh, but with a feeling of loneliness uh, from the health sector. But it's been, it's been a fight, uh, a development, uh, a very satisfactory activity for me, because by the late of 80s and early the 90s, uh, coinciding with the return of democracy in our country, and taking into account that there were very interesting mental health initiatives in Chile before the coup d'etat that were wiped out, many of those uh, initiatives. Those uh, triggers, uh, those boosters were exiled, they were, uh, they were taken away from the country. We have to think about the uh, Dr. Marconi in the south, uh, Dr. Cordero in Temuco. The many initiatives we may pick up from those years, which are pioneers in the Latin American context, uh, and that they only was restarted with the return of democracy. And it had a very happy coincidence that it was uh, the regional conference of the Pan-American Organization of Health in Caracas that even though it has an approach on the psychiatric hospital and restructuration of the um, psychiatric assistance, we cannot stop recognizing that the change in the assistance model that generates the psychiatric restructuration enables mental health to be close to the community. Without that, resources are concentrated in few institutions without saying the sequel of hazard of injuries in the institutionalization. Another reason for being happy is that there's a millennium initiative that the state has decided, has chosen, and today 
I knew that this is also an opinion of uh, foreign uh, judges uh, that the state has decided to put a millennium initiative on mental health, uh, particularly on repression and personality uh, issues. Why? Because depression is without question the part not of madness, but the common mental disorder. The, this, this is an expression I like, this distinction of the common mental disorders, uh, such as the expression in the plane of the illness, of the social, uh, the social uh, bad things, uh, the pain, accidents of development, in interaction with biology, in interaction with uh, growing up stars. Uh, I don't know if in a moment the World Health Organization will define the end of distinction mind and body, but we will have to do that in a moment because I think it's been very harmful thinking about the dichotomy of the mind and body, uh, psychology and biology, when the evidence says that everything is together and this is just an academic distinction. Our indigenous uh, uh, people do not do this distinction. They don't know about mental health. They know about well-beingness, but being uh, harmony, disharmony. Well, they, we talk to them about psych psychiatry or mental health, they don't understand that. The other reason for being happy here is looking at the confluence of university centers and research teams. I think that's something very meritorious. Uh, I don't know what it has happened uh, before, but today we're seeing this. And I think that could uh, could have an important important consequences and impacts on other scopes of research and working teams. No university has a representation as big representation as in order to be everywhere and address all issues. So it's very very good that this is being happened that way. And the, since uh, 1990 up to date, uh, we've had two mental health plans. One that was generated in 1993. There was a previous uh, plan that was it's little touch uh, from 1989, 1990 that was uh, had a short lifespan, and the one 1993 that starts a transformation pro pro uh, process, and then we started on 2000. Since then, in Chile, there's been very important development on service uh, networks. Uh, by 1990, we have 1% of the mental health, budget, sorry, of the health budget on mental health from one cake of health that was much lower than the one we have today. I don't know exactly how many times lower, but it should be 10 or many many dozens, uh, dozens of times, uh, the mental health was very harmed during the, uh, the dictatorship and was disarticulated. This growth of mental health that unfortunately doesn't reach 3% today is without question a much bigger 3%. It's not three times we had in the 1% in 1990. That has enabled us to have today mental health in general hospitals. We have psychiatric beds in most general hospitals, but not on all of them. We have an important, very important presence of the mental health work in primary health care with all the deficiencies um, we may find. But we have to say that in the regional context, there are few countries having that level of introduction of mental health on primary health care. And there is there are no only issues about resource investment, but re reluctance is stigma, stigma. When mental health is being introduced on general health, it is overcoming a barrier and a stigma. There are countries without any psychiatric bed in general hospitals. There are many countries where mental health institutions are the psychiatric institutions. These are big assets today, and we need to enhance. Today, we are developing a new mental health and national plan. And that's part of the alignment of the planets, because in this alignment of uh, planets, uh, phenomena such as 
we have congressmen discussing about the national program on mental health. We have universities discussing about the national program on mental health. We have users, families, organizations, mental health teams, on regional secretaries in the service networks. And we think this is going to be this is going to be a very interesting process. But this also being generated the need of a mental health act that has been matured in the set of the society, and today the parliament asked the Ministry of Health what's going on with this. The Catholic University has been developing research in, the, in its initiative of public policy and study of a law. We, within the Ministry of Health, we are doing our own work. Um, this is also relevant to the Millennium Initiative because we have also detected that despite of the progress we have in the service network, in the introduction of mental health and primary health care, in general hospitals, into community centers on mental health, we have expanded the treatment coverage at levels we never had before, but they are anyway very low compared to what we want. We are close to 20%. We estimate the coverage of treatment with people of mental disorders. When we look at epidemiology, I, we don't know whether we have impacted or not. We still have very high mental disorder figures. It seems to be 25% of people are affected by, by mental disorders. As it was mentioned earlier, we have very high suicide rates that fortunately have been decreased during the last four years, and we have come back to the rates we had in 2000 after an increase that, uh, that signed the warning lights. But the question is, are we capable of modifying prevalences, improving treatments, or do we improve the clinical conditions of those who are ill? And I come back to, this, to the story of the law, because the National Plan of Mental Health says we want intersectoral actions on prevention and promotion. We want intersectoral actions on inclusion. What does it mean? It means we want work, home, education, justice, environment, all of them taking care of the mental health of citizenship and people with disabilities who are going to live on the community, going out from a psychiatric hospital, or they live on streets. When we pick, take them and we give them support, which is the word we like, support, not care, not care for being citizens once again, we want these to do this all together because health is funding protected homes, health is inventing labor alternatives, working positions, in health, there's a labor of protecting rights, but we have a web of uh, regulations which is very violent against human rights. We have labor legislations that enables a temporary worker to be fired and not to pay the bonus and then hire again and then fire her again, and those things produce mental health, mental disorders. That's why I say plan law initiatives like this are linked together. They are contributed. They could be mutually empowering, they could mutually empowering a better mental health for the country. Talking about prevalences, I don't even want to tell you how many times a week we ask ourselves in the mental health uh, disorder, uh, the mental health department, which is the prevalence, which is the relationship between the uh, Benjamin Vicente's uh, prevalence uh, researchers in the 90s that show figures of depression close to 8% with the figure of prevalence of depressive symptoms. We put the name in the National Survey on Health in 2010 that says we have about 18%. Who's saying the truth? Who's measuring what are they measuring? Do we know what are we measuring when we measure depression? Do we know what is and being understood as depression, the general physician, which are the boundaries between between sadness, pain, suffering for his economic cause for a maltreatment, where depression starts, where the illness starts. Where are we moving through us to put resources? Where do we define it requires psychotherapy or drugs? 
are we hiding a social problem through medication? I think these are answers that researchers conducted by the Millennium Initiative could be researched. I think that's quite necessary. I won't tell you good news if you don't know. The next uh, national survey on health for the first time on history of Chile will have a mental health section. Uh, we will measure not only depression but also anxiety, uh, consumption of substances, uh, probably psychosis. We are figuring out which are the sections that could be applied in relation to prevalences, sampling universe and the funds available. But for the first time, there will be a mental health survey on its own. Regarding personality, well, that for me is, is a big surprise. I think, in general, we have gone aside in, in public health and mental health to personality. We all know it exists, we all know it is affected, it is impacted, but we know how difficult it is intervening on it, how expensive is intervening on it. Usually we go to the first axis and we go away from the second, but when we are clinical uh, professionals, we know the way it impacts on, on people. It is quite interesting that this initiative also could research what happens along the life with personality and with depression, how the status with the ways of being plays their role, as to say it. That's a dimension, and I think it's very exciting on what you are starting. The social determinants studies have progressed a lot around the world, and today we know what things could be useful. We know that in the childhood, the most important is protecting against uh, abusement and uh, violence uh, and uh, encouraging the link. Uh, we know that in the school uh, children, uh, the, the most important is the school environment, that in adults, the work environment is critical, that in other people, the prevention from isolation and the prevention of uh, loss of social signification is the most important. So there we have access to study, because not anything being done here would be useful. So we have Chile Growth with you, which is a wonderful policy. Hopefully we have surveys showing the impact, because they are very expensive policies that we are sure they are benefiting a lot of children, but we want to know the concrete figures. I th we have programs measuring lifestyles at schools, and I think in the workplace we have a lot of gaps, and we are just start thinking about the elderly. Not to say all the evidence according to regarding socioeconomical level and common mental disorders. There are studies saying that not only the socioeconomical level, but the endowment rate. Chile is a country of people indebted. And there are surveys that says it's not the same being a poor person in a poor uh, country than a poor person in a rich country. It's, bet, it's better being poor in a poor country because the difference, the social gap, generates disorders. There are lots of topics to be studied. Last but not least are other focuses that you can imagine, and you have explained this better than I could, that what things are useful, which are the use, uh, useful interventions, which are the psychotherapies we need. Because psychotherapy is expensive. It requires a lot of human resources, lots of time, intensity, frequency. It requires links. It requires space. We have to know if we are going to implement psychotherapy in a regular basis, uh, regulated, uh, extended across uh, the health uh, services, both primary health care as well as secondary health care. We have to know which are the useful ones, how much can we invest, uh, how how much time do we need? And that's critical for the implementation of the national plan and for a law on mental health that has to say how much money do we have. It is very important to link together all these worlds we are moving across. Saying, just to wrap up, that we want to be close to you in this business, in this enterprise. We don't want this to happen away from those who want for time, and those after us will be in charge of defining, designing, and thinking about the public policies. We want this to be a close task. We've had other experiences of public research funds. We have had very interesting results that are helping us to validate the assistance models, the organization models of services. 
we've been able to know, for instance, that as long as a community model is implemented in a, bit, in a better way, hospitalizations decrease, urgencies decrease, and that's very relevant. It's very relevant to know that because we have to show things. When you are going to ask for money, you have to show what you are asking for is useful. useful. Therefore, I want to say we do want to be close to you. We do not want to break the link. It is not easy to keep the link because you you are going to start working and you are going to be fed up of work and we are full of work. So keeping the link is an active effort. And I want you to put and want us to put a little bit of energy on that. Thank you very much. We want to thank Dr. Mauricio Gomez, Chief of the Department of Mental Health, for these words. But, okay, now everything is science in this inauguration uh, day. Of, I want to invite you to, to, to the Madalena Mate, the national singer, by the, along with the guitarist uh, Simon Gonzalez for Musical Journey. Let's receive her with a big applause. Bueno, muchísimas gracias por esta invitación. Me siento sumamente honrada de ser parte de, de esta inauguración en un tema tan, tan potente, tan complejo y maravilloso al mismo tiempo que es la mente humana. ¿no? Así que muchas gracias por su existencia, por la ciencia. Y qué bonito poder enlazar dos motivos, la ciencia y la música, que yo también pienso que la música es un gran canal de sanación para la mente very good drug for mine. Tantas veces me mataron Tantas veces me morí Sin embargo estoy aquí resucitando Gracias doy a la desgracia y a la mano con puñal Porque me trató tan mal Y seguí cantando Cantando al sol como la cigarra Después de un año bajo la tierra Igual que sobreviviente Que vuelve de la guerra Tantas veces me borraron Tantas desaparecí a mi propio entierro fui sola y llorando Hice un nudo en el pañuelo Pero me olvidé después Que no era la única vez Y seguí cantando Cantando al sol como la cigarra Después de un año bajo la tierra Igual que sobreviviente Que vuelve de la guerra Tantas veces me mataron Tantas resucitarás Cuántas noches pasarás desesperado Y a la hora del naufragio Y a la de la oscuridad Alguien te rescatará Para ir cantando Cantando al sol Como la cigarra Después de un año bajo la tierra Igual que sobreviviente Que vuelve de la guerra Y cantando al sol 
como la cigarra Después de un año bajo la tierra Igual que sobreviviente Que vuelve de la guerra No pasa nada, esto es parte de la vida. A mí también me interesa mucho... No te preocupes, alcanzo todavía, tengo buena vista. <ríe> me interesa lo que es el análisis también de la mente y por ahí viajo en algunas temáticas. Esta canción se llama El duelo, que tiene que ver cómo el alma cambia de vestido. Aquí vamos. Se nos cuela, se viste de infinito Se cuelga de la rama, se hace lucerito ¡Epa! ¿A dónde va? Desnuda se despoja del cuerpo y su alarío Se vuelve más ligera que los pajarillos el alma le hace el quite al hombre y su destino Y al zapateo arranca mostrando sus tobillos Y al zapateo arranca mostrando sus tobillos Antes de partir y de un suspirar Me dejan las palabras tendidas en el sofá Justo en la quietud con silencio audaz se le va por los aires bailando con la pena. En un duelo moreno la noche canta y se va, se va y vuela, vuela. El alma se evapora, se escapa sin permiso Se teje una mantilla con la voz de un niño es. Alegre coquetea de falda y abanico Le sigue culebreando a la muerte con su guiño le sigue culebreando a la muerte con su guiño Antes de partir y de un suspirar Me deja las palabras tendidas en el sofá Justo en la quietud, con silencio audaz Se le va por los aires bailando con la vela Se le va por los aires bailando con la vela en un duelo moreno la noche canta En un duelo moreno la noche canta En un duelo moreno la noche llora y canta Se fue Muchísimas gracias Thank you very much. Y terminamos entonces con And esta we're finishing with this wonderful song with a huge content on it, a million times sung maybe, but every day, every second has a great power. Thank you very much for this invitation. Gracias a la vida de Violeta Parra. Gracias a la vida, bye Violeta Parra.
gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto me dio dos luceros que cuando los abro perfecto distingo lo negro del blanco y en el alto cielo su fondo estrellado y en las multitudes el hombre que yo amo gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto me ha dado el sonido y el abecedario con él las palabras que pienso y declaro madre amigo hermano y luz alumbrando la ruta del alma del que estoy amando Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto Me ha dado la marcha de mis pies cansados Con ellos anduve ciudades y charcos Playas y desiertos, montañas y llanos Y la casa tuya, tu calle Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto Me dio el corazón que agita su marco Cuando miro al buen del cerebro humano Cuando miro al bueno tan lejos del malo Cuando miro el fondo de tus ojos claros Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto Me ha dado la risa y me ha dado el llanto Así yo distingo dicha de quebranto Los dos materiales que forman mi canto Y el canto de ustedes que es el mismo canto y el canto de todos que es mi propio canto Gracias a la vida que me ha dado tanto Muchísimas gracias Simón González, gracias Más fuerte el aplauso para Magdalena y Simón, cantautores nacionales que se han presentado hoy día en esta ceremonia de inauguración. Y siguiendo con esta ceremonia, quiero a continuación invitar al profesor Juan Pablo Jiménez, que es investigador asociado del Instituto Milenio para la Investigación de la Depresión y Personalidad, quien será el encargado de presentar a su vez Center ante todos Mirad, ustedes al connotado investigador inglés, académico del University College London y también director ejecutivo de Anna Freud Management Center, director of the el doctor Freud Peter Center. Von Agy, quien Dr. tocará una Peter conferencia Agy, magistral para dar por inaugurado este Instituto Milenio para la Investigación y Depresión y Personalidad. Profesor Juan Pablo Jiménez. Profesor Jiménez, por favor. Hola, buenas tardes. Good evening. Para mí es un privilegio. For me, it's a privilege. Pero sobre todo, but un above de all, a reason of joy to present Professor Peter. El profesor 
Professor Fonagy is a psychologist and psychoanalyst born in Hungary and living in London since teenage. He is the director of the Child and Teenage program of the United Kingdom, which objective is perfecting the access of young patients to prevention and intervention in mental health on the public context, which in England is the Majority. It's also a member of the board of the Odles program. Professor Fonagy is leader of the UCL Partners, a center which aims at the implementation of results of investigation on cutting edge and innovation and measurable achievements on well being and health in London. United Kingdom and worldwide, and the North Thames National Institute for Health Research, that conducts research applied to health and quality of attention in public health care. These centers are the ones that address the focuses of the United Kingdom efforts. Mauricio Gomez should speak to him, right? Dr. Fonagui is the director of the Department of Investigation of Health and the University College of London, and is also the head of the Floyd Memorial Chair, as director of the unit of psychoanalysis of the same institution. At the same time, is management director of the Anne Floyd Center and consultant of child and family program in the Department Meninger of Psychiatry and Sciences of the Behavior and the Medicine School in Baylor, Texas, USA, on the same country. The, it's a visiting professor of the schools of medicine of Yale and Harvard. Throughout the, his career, he has been in positions in diverse public organizations in the United Kingdom, including the management of the group of reference for the measurement of results at the national level. Professor Fonagy designed and implemented a rigorous quality control the British mental health must follow in the public area. Likewise, he has addressed the development of two medical guidance for investigation of mental health for the Excellence Institute of Ministry of Health in England, and also the development of the occupational centers that every psychotherapist might, must follow, the ones that work in the UK currently. Its clinical interests are related to the early attachment behavior, violence, and the limited uh, personality. Its main uh, method has been an empirical evidence for the limit trust, limit disorder. I'm talking about the mentalization treatment, which has been developed with the collaboration of several clinical centers of England, Scandinavia, and USA. Whether it's homeland is psychoanalysis, it's Contribution. His contribution is acknowledged beyond the borders of psychoanalysis, mainly because of its ability of integrating knowledge, theories, and results coming from different mind disciplines, as psychoanalysis, phenomenology, theory of attachment, neuroscience, positive psychology, psychopathy of the development, all of this in the framework of the rigor that provides science and the systematic empiric evidence. Currently, Professor Fonagy is main researcher or co-researcher on projects which, which funds are equivalent to 17 million Chilean pesos of 50 million pounds. He has been author or co-author of 19 books with other three being printed. He is a member of the British Chamber of the Association of, Sin of Sociological Science and he has been also a member of the Psychiatry Institute in the USA. He has been awarded several awards for the trajectory of the psychology the Willard Prize, the Science Academy, British Science Academy, and Child Health. He has received the Order of the British Empire, an award given by the British Crown by its contribution to psychology and psychoanalysis. And I could continue, but I think it's enough with this background to present a scientist that is remarkable. And there's something much more important that I would like to add. I mean personal details of Peter that add some sense and human touch to its presence.
among us. I met Peter during a clinical trial in Germany in 18, I mean 19. It's an old friendship. On the 1989, I was about to come back to Chile after five years on own, where I trained on researcher in psychotherapy and I got my PhD. We were not more than 20 people and in a format that is typical of psychoanalysis, Peter has been invited to present clinical material, so to say, the case of a patient that was with him on the trip. On the presented material by him, we knew the interventions that years after were to form the treatment based on mentalization during the break, Peter came to me and he said, Juan Pablo, in English, right? We're starting a professional career. We belong to the same generation. And I think that it would be good that we are friends. And by saying this, he Stretch my hand. I bumped into him again when around the early 90s we were both part of the International Signalist Association. During those years, I observed from a certain distance how his productive creativity was spreading through medical publications, books, and its presentation on the numerous congresses I attended to. There, I was uh, overwhelmed with this open-mindedness and the capacity of integrating knowledge from different areas of the man study to the service of, tre of psychological treatments that were efficient. And nevertheless, when I learned the most from him, it was during the last decade. On 2007, Peter invited me to be a part of the teaching group on the research area that was being done on the University College of London which he leads. But this school summer, by its idea of Peter, which had 17 versions, we had more than 200 young researchers coming from everywhere in the world to meet with a group of teachers in the framework of an, uh, hard work that was 10 days. For me, it was one of the most important experiences of my professional and academic development. Young people coming from Europe, the USA, Latin America, Asia, Australia, they presented their research projects which were discussed by a bunch of teachers, mostly legendary teachers. There I learned that science is an entrepreneur that is mostly collaborative. I understood that we are pygmies on the arms of giants. And who led the program was Peter. I appreciated its magnificent, its rigorous, its teaching rigorousness, its kindness to share knowledge and its always positive attitude facing the students that came from other countries as China or Korea. I can now say with joy and gratitude that most of our development as a Chilean group of research in psychotherapy that has ended on the Millennium Institute that now gathers us here, it has to do with learnings that I made on London in this program. In this moment where we are fighting for a new institutionality for science of our country, it is worth it to remember that the formation of scientific groups that are skillful, it comes from the development of international networks where personal relationships are a key element. Ladies and gentlemen, with you, Professor Mr. Peter Fonagy. Thank you very, very much, Juan Pablo. If just my life could live up to his introduction, I would die a happy man. Um, let me say that uh, it's a tremendous honor to be here and uh, uh, enjoy with you the uh, remarkable gift that uh, the Chilean government has given this group of scientists. I 
um, envious because scientists are usually envious of each other. Um, but at the same time, I'm very, very proud to be uh, even just a very small part of this tremendous step forward for your country in an area that really could not be bettered in terms of uh, its importance and the likely benefit uh, that it will bring to the people of this country and uh, Latin America and perhaps the rest of the world. I uh, am humbled by the responsibility of uh, helping you uh, open this event and uh, uh, all I can say is that if my words fail me, the slides will be available uh, uh, from anyone who wants them, uh, sadly, in English. Uh, but uh, uh, I'd be very happy to uh, send them to you. Um, I just want to start with a few things that I feel proud of. Um, and this is just me showing off, and you don't actually have to listen. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and, and one of the things that I, I feel proud of and, uh, uh, is, is uh, the mentalizing mafia. Uh, those people who have, I've been working with collaboratively who've actually achieved uh, together uh, a, an important step, I hope, in the treatment of individuals with uh, personality disorder. Um, in particular, uh, I uh, want to uh, remember uh, Anthony Bateman uh, and uh, also uh, Patrick Loyton, whose work I'll be referring to. But in addition to the people um, in England, uh, there, are, uh, there is an American branch. And uh, 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 together with uh, colleagues from uh, this country, uh, we hope to advance the uh, subject of uh, mentalizing uh, uh, colleagues in Europe and, and many, many others. But what I feel really proud of is, is this, that Her Royal Highness, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, visited the Anna Freud Center earlier this year, uh, and we thought it was an enormously significant step uh, for a future Queen of England to be visiting uh, a children's uh, and young people's mental health center. And we hope that this would give a tremendous boost to mental health and children's mental health in particular uh, in uh, my country um, because this was the first visit that she made after her uh, uh, giving birth to uh, um, uh, Charlotte, um, Princess Charlotte, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and uh, unfortunately, the media didn't quite identify the same things that we hoped that they would identify. So here is the one from Daily Mail. <laughs> Keith Middleton and Ralph Lauren dress to resume royal duties after Princess Charlotte's birth. Um, uh, even more uh, painful uh, was uh, from uh, the Daily Telegraph. The Duchess of Cambridge shows off new fringe at first solo engagements in birth of Charlotte. And then uh, from uh, uh, breaking hair news, Kate Middleton returns to work with a bang. She is the... <laughs> She is very, very, very pretty. Anyway, uh, uh, um, so um, now moving on, um, I, I want to just um, start by presenting the results of a trial uh, of uh, the psychodynamic therapy for depression uh, because it raises some of the issues about the relationship between depression and personality, which I think um, we uh, need to take on board. 
so this is uh, um, uh, a trial of depression, um, which as uh, uh, studies have shown, and uh, um, Dr. Gomez referred to some of the uh, prevalent studies that uh, have been done, and I totally agree with him that currently from these studies we neither know what depression is or how common it is or how seriously we should take that or indeed how these figures apply across countries. Uh, however, we know that some people, um, uh, probably about 15% uh, overall or maybe as much as a quarter uh, of uh, women, um, do complain of dysphoria and uh, are seeking help for this uh, in large numbers. Um, and uh, it's estimated that obviously it's a, it's a very significant health problem in the future. But what I want to emphasize is really the seriousness of the disorder. The relapse rates um, within three years run at about 30%. And uh, somewhere between 70 and 80% um, within three years in individuals who had three or more episodes already. Um, that you have a 90% chance of having a second episode if you had one episode. So it's not something that people generally get over. And what we know, certainly in England, is that interventions for depression come lamentably late. That is, long after, particularly in adolescence, that the brain has accommodated to low moods, eating, disorder, eating problems, libidinal problems, and a whole range in activity, irritability, and so on. Um, and the brain sets itself up for depression, probably frequently in adolescence. Unless we intervene early, as we've learned we have to do with psychosis, I think there is a, a significant and major problem uh, that faces us in terms of public health needs. And in terms of, of uh, um, uh, the mission um, that uh, Dr. Marion Krause and her colleagues have taken on, I was delighted to hear the importance that was being given to children, particularly uh, very young children and adolescents, because really it's at the heart of the problem. Going back to us uh, uh, adults, I think um, we can, having had one episode of depression, uh, we can accept, expect about four uh, in a, a lifetime. Um, elsewhere, I have summarized uh, the effectiveness of psychodynamic psychotherapies, and I'm not going to uh, summarize them here, but I do want to say that the evidence is not strong for psychodynamic psychotherapies um, because of, uh, there are not enough uh, good studies and few indicators of what the treatments should be, uh, who are, what patients uh, are particularly suitable for it. Um, and in terms of longer term treatments, um, uh, there are very few um, studies that are randomized uh, controlled studies. Um, one thing that seemed to us was that perhaps we are measuring the wrong things in terms of outcome and not for long enough um, to uh, really establish the effectiveness of long-term psychodynamic psychotherapies. Uh, there's one indicator um, that is really a very powerful indicator of any effectiveness of any treatment and that is death or mortality. And if I just draw your attention to uh, three white male groups uh, and their rate of mortality as a function of age, um, uh, you see here uh, that um, 
white males uh, kind of start dying off in their, you know, in their 60s uh, quite rapidly. Um, this is not good news for me. Uh, uh, but if you are medically qualified, the situation is slightly improved. Uh, doctors live longer. But if you're a psychoanalyst, it looks a hell of a lot better. So clearly, psychoanalysis is the treatment of choice for life. Uh, I, I, I maybe this is from public health point of view, not sufficiently strong evidence. Anyway, um, here we come with a randomized control trial that uh, we had published uh, recently that has taught us a, a, a few lessons. It's a Tavistock adult depression study um, and uh, um, came out in, in, in world psychiatry. Um, 18 months treatment uh, and a two year follow up period. Um, I'm not going to go into the design of the study, we don't have time for it. Enough to say that we took patients who were who had two previous treatments, treatment failures. So these are refractory or treatment resistant uh, patients. And they had senior uh, therapists. Um, uh, the uh, control condition was evidence-based treatments offered in the context of primary care. Uh, I'm not going to go through the consort diagram. It looks rather beautiful and took ages to draw up. But, uh, all that it's saying, really, that what I want to draw attention to, is that after two years, we were able to find uh, three quarters of our participants. Uh, that's two years uh, follow-up, so at 18 months treatment, and two years later, we found 75% uh, of our participants. Um, so what were the results? Um, well, this is the important bit. Uh, full recovery was very rare and certainly did not uh, distinguish uh, the two groups. Uh, so at 18 months and 42 months, the groups were the same um, and uh, were not significantly different from one another, but only 10%, 15% uh, uh, recovered fully. However, uh, on a, a more lenient measure of recovery, there was a substantial improvement. Um, but there is something quite interesting here. What we found was that at the end of treatment, at 18 months, there were no significant differences between the groups in terms of recovery. That the differences emerged over the follow-up period. Uh, to illustrate this, and this may be too complicated a graph, this is the Hamilton depression scores. And what you can see on this graph is that um, the graphs start diverging, the two lines start diverging at about 18 months. Um, and they diverge in the sense that those treated in the community without expert treatment, without uh, expert psychodynamic psychotherapy actually start getting worse again. Can you see that? Is that clear on that graph? That, that top line there. Those treated um, up to 18 months actually continue reasonably well. Why am I drawing your attention to it? I'm drawing your attention to it because the clinicians who treated these people stopped seeing them at this stage. They had no idea that their patients would be doing well. So as long as we rely just on the clinician's judgment about who does well and who does badly, they are very poorly, in a very poor position to know whether their patients have benefited from the treatment or not. Is, am I being clear about that? Um, it's a really important point because at the moment, clinicians probably keep their patients in treatment for longer than necessary 
in order to feel certain that their patients will improve. So one of the little tasks for uh, your group is to try and see just how many weeks or months of treatment is genuinely necessary in order to ensure that uh, an expected recurrence of the disorder is prevented, which is really the outcome that we want. Um, uh, this is, I want to emphasize, a medium effect size. It's not a superbly strong effect, but where the effect occurs is, uh, and you can see here, is there are few in the, those treated in long-term psychodynamic psychotherapy have fewer severe uh, uh, or very severe cases uh, than those who are treated in, in the community. But most of them, you know, in terms of those with moderate uh, or mild indications, they, they remain symptomatic. Not a panacea, it doesn't cure, you remain symptomatic. Um, uh, I am uh, going to rapidly move on. Uh, Self-report measures reveal the same things, uh, similar size effects. Uh, and in terms of diagnosis, independently assessed, blind by a psychiatrist uh, who didn't know the, uh, the arm the patient was in, you get uh, substantial differences uh, emerging uh, from uh, 18 months, uh, which is heartening. In terms of uh, general adaptation scores, again, the differences are marked and uh, uh, apparent. Um, and disappointingly, suicidal intent is not reduced in, in the treatment. It's, uh, and it's, it's present, uh, but not reduced. Nor are uh, indications of personality disorder. And this is really what I'd like to be talking about today, the relationship of depression and personality disorder, which I don't think is inappropriate for uh, an initiative which is about depression and personality. Um, so, um, in conclusion about this study, uh, I would say three things. First, um, that a psychodynamic treatment um, uh, in a very severe group can actually be effective, uh, but this effect emerges two years after the end of treatment and, and in terms of the absence of recurrence, but it has no impact on suicidality. And there are a number of limitations uh, about the study which uh, are quite significant and I won't talk about them because they're too embarrassing. Um, I do want to mention though that there are an awful lot of people involved. Um, let me now turn to the main subject, the depression and personality disorder. Is it comorbidity or is it uh, a continuum? So there is indication that no treatment is particularly effective for depression. So either pharmacotherapy or psychotherapy is effective in about 50% of cases. Um, and what may be underpinning this is the high comorbidity between personality disorder and uh, depression. Some studies do not show this relationship, uh, but others do. But the, fa the studies that do not show the relationship are really important for us to understand because it might provide some clues about the nature of the association between the two. So studies that do not show the relationship are usually ones where the samples were purified, but individuals who were suicidal are excluded from the sample. This happens particularly in the United States, studies in the United States, because of the risks associated uh, with suicidality there. Uh, 
And the important point here is that depression is the primary risk factor for suicide. So excluding these people is a joke. Uh, is like saying, you know, I'm going to uh, study um, uh, carcinoma, but I'm going to uh, exclude people who are stage three and above. Uh, and surprise, surprise, my survive, five-year survival rates are really very good. Um, the second is even more important. Studies that actually provided a better structure for the treatment show less of an effect of personality disorder on outcomes. But most studies uh, actually show that the two uh, relate to one another, and not only that, but the presence of personality disorder makes the outcomes of uh, treatments of depression poorer. Not surprising uh, that, the, that the two should be linked because depression and dysphoria are co core features of borderline personality disorder um, as well uh, as depression. Um, uh, although, as you will see, some claim that the features of dysphoria may be different in personality disorder. Um, but uh, I think it's important to bear in mind that in, it, there is a good case to be made that for individuals who have personality disorder, a treatment that's based on insight, reflective capacities, actually that treatment of depression may be iatrogenic, may be harmful, that those people may be worse off for having treatment uh, than they would have been if they never had treatment. And um, I would say that there is an issue here of two kinds of pathologies. And this is the main point I'm going to try and make, that I'd like, if I can explain it properly, I'll be very pleased. That there are two kinds of pathologies that we face when we look at an individual who is presenting with depression. On the one hand, they have distorted mental representations. They have, as those uh, uh, clinicians who practice cognitive behavior therapy and, and, and similar treatments have shown us, they misunderstand and misconstrue some aspects uh, of the world. Their representations are in some ways biased in a negative way. But more important, um, there is also an aspect to this pathology which involves the inadequacy of the mental processes that generate mental representations that are much, have much more of a pervasive uh, effect. So this is what I'm going to be trying to talk about, a distortion of metacognitive capacities, the capacities that actually generate and are in control of the creation of mental representations. But let's look at some figures, but I, 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 again, I'll be brief about this. Um, what we know is that in, uh, when uh, in England, uh, and we have now about a million cases in a, an improved access to psychological therapy model whose outcomes are being monitored systematically, when these participants uh, were looked at, those with significant depression, it was found that individuals who meet screening criteria for personality disorder do significantly worse at the end of their treatment in terms of their severity. They still look worse. But even more important, that um, uh, uh, they are more likely to remain clinical cases at the end of their treatment than those without personality disorder. Further, 
that if you are uh, looking at um, the extent to which an individual has changed, those with personality disorder are likely to change less. So, um, is borderline personality disorder just a mood disorder? And there have been very different conceptualizations of borderline personality disorder. Um, and I'm not going to uh, go into these in any detail. Um, enough to say that um, there is a massive amount of confusion um, uh, in relation to this diagnosis. Uh, much of it highly controversial, even amongst experts uh, in the field um, who will argue about it. Uh, and I'm part of this argument, and I've changed my mind from one side to another several times. I really don't know who is right. Uh, between those who feel that borderline personality disorder is a clinical diagnosis and those who feel that uh, it's not a diagnosis, it just happens to be um, a bunch of symptoms, and I will try and suggest to you what the answer is from a study in a moment, uh, which I think actually provides the answer, but I would because it was our study. Um, but uh, from our perspective here, um, uh, we know that borderline personality disorder is particularly characterized by the dysregulation of affect. Uh, and the instability of affect. So it's inevitable that it should show dysphoria and depression as a substantial indication uh, of uh, uh, its uh, clinical uh, presence. Uh, so there was going to be, the thing is going to be sorted out in the new DSM. Um, however, I don't know what you think here in Latin America. Some of us in Europe were a little bit disappointed by the new DSM. Um, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, um, I, I, I don't want to be. Uh, this is no comment on nationalities or. or, or, or uh, but uh, basically. Um, the new DSM was pretty much like the old DSM, and in fact, the definition of personality disorder didn't change at all. Um, uh, some of us were suggesting that it should, but it was, uh, in the end, uh, ignored. Um, so, um, uh, the problem with it is that any disease in DSM is diagnosed in terms of the symptoms that the disease shows. So, in order to meet criteria for anxiety disorder, you have to show that you feel anxious. And you go to your doctor and you say, doctor, I feel anxious. And the doctor says, I think you've got anxiety disorder. <laughs> and you say, thank you, doctor. I feel a lot better now. Um, but it's also polythetic, which means that uh, you, a, num a number of symptoms that you have to meet, and you'll see has, has created a major uh, mess conceptually and empirically. But don't listen to me about this. Look at the reviews. Um, uh, these are some reviews of uh, the SM5, and I shall read them out slowly because they're worth studying. It's boom time in the world of mental disorders. They are proliferating at such a rate that it is sometimes difficult for drug companies to keep up. Are you moody, lazy, impulsive, or irritable? Do you get nervous sometimes, or not feel life is great all the time? Well, come on in. You might find a label right here. Perhaps it's self-defeating personality disorder, or a touch of social phobia. fifth edition, now worse than ever. The astonishing failure of the categorizations of psychiatric diagnosis to self-vindicate is now even more evident. Instead of the true nature of mental illness becoming more clear and accurate over time, the effort to carve nature at its joint, 
continues and it has never been more controversial. The British Psychological Society have described this document as shrinking the pool of people who may be considered normal in society to the size of a puddle. Uh, it's not a friendly uh, commentary. Um, so the problems with the diagnostic approach uh, is that they do not predict outcomes, that neuroimaging techniques fail to support the categories, and genetic markers are equally unable to assist reliable diagnosis. So, um, what's the alternative here? Well, let's look at BPD and depression as having some common elements. I want to highlight three for you. One is insecure attachment. So, insecure attachment predicts depression and borderline personality disorder. Uh, also predicts the recurrence of depression and more depressive episodes and residual symptoms, the uh, longer use of antidepressants, impairments in social functioning, as well as suicide. And both disorders are marked by a history of attachment disruption, interpersonal dependency, as well as uh, self-critical perfectionism. Both disorders <clears throat> are linked to uh, stress. Uh, early adversity is likely to be playing a part. Uh, by early adversity, I mean even adversity that occurs inside, um, uh, pre-birth, uh, inside the womb. Uh, stress inside the womb may be a significant factor in creating hyperactivity of the HPA axis. And that impairment of the capacity for resilience uh, actually may impair the capacity of the individual to withstand uh, stress. And that applies equally to uh, both diagnoses. So early adversity, impaired effect regulation, stress, responsive, stress responsivity, and social problem solving skills may be common features of both disorders, uh, making an individual vulnerable to depression as well as personality disorder. And finally, uh, our own uh, particular concern here, which is the difficulty in uh, the capacity to um, be reflective about our own mental states. There is uh, quite good evidence that individuals with depression have difficulties in mentalizing, uh, which I'll talk more about in a minute, uh, just the same way as individuals with uh, personality disorder do. Uh, there are uh, shared um, features in terms of impairments of social cognition um, that have probably common neural underpinnings, both from the top down regulation as also from uh, uh, the bottom up. Um, and uh, factors such as rejection sensitivity, which may be a core symptom of borderline personality disorder, is so much at the heart of both that this strong sensitivity to the reactions of others and to be devastated by how someone else thinks of one may be an indication of this anomaly of social cognition. So, in summary, trying to frame the discussion on depression, um, I'm trying to suggest to you that all mental disorders entail two types of pathology. One are disordered or distorted mental representations, and the second are dysfunctional mental processes. The difference between the two you've just heard. The guitar that you heard is the instrument, the mental process that generates the sounds, the tune, that is the mental representation. 
And if there is something fundamentally wrong with the guitar, you can't play a tune uh, well enough, however skillful you might be. Depression entails shared features in terms of uh, attachment, stress regulation, and social cognition. So in order to understand depression properly and to treat depression properly, we have to understand personality disorder. Before selling this idea fully, I want to be sure that you know that I know that the two are not the same. And I'm not going to talk about that too much, but I know that in borderline personality disorder, depression is often lasts shorter durations, um, and uh, actually the painfulness of the experience is greater in uh, BPD than is uh, in depression. It, the, the feeling of emptiness is a distress that few of us can understand if we haven't experienced borderline personality disorder. Um, the fear of abandonment can be there in both, but it's more likely to lead to self-destructive behavior and suicide uh, and self-harm in uh, 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 personality disorder. But what I want to talk to you about now, this is actually quite interesting, I hope you'll find it interesting, is that we actually have to rethink the transdiagnostic structure of mental disorder. That actually, DSM has probably got it wrong. And the reason they got it wrong is because they did not look at mental disorder developmentally. They asked people about how they have been feeling over the last six months. And when you ask people about how they felt over the last six months, then you mix people who have recurrent problems with those who have single episodes of problems. And these are probably quite different people. You certainly mix the extent to which conditions are comorbid, occur together. And you also mess up the severity, as well as probably, I will suggest to you, the etiology, the causation. What I want to talk to you about is that some individuals, and many with depression are amongst these, are just more prone to persistent psychopathology than others. Now let me share some evidence with you. This is um, a very complicated graph uh, from a study of Caspi and colleagues on a thousand New Zealand uh, uh, individuals over a thousand followed from age 18 right through to age 38. What I want to emphasize there, that disorders like depression or general anxiety disorder uh, or uh, alcoholism or conduct disorder or drug abuse or mania or schizophrenia or OCD belong to so-called spectral level clusters, internalizing, externalizing, and thought disorder. And these, we, this we have known for a long time. There's nothing new there. Somewhat new that obsessive compulsive disorder, which I always would have grouped with internalizing, actually turns out over time to be in the thought disorder category. But the important point that came out from Caspi's research was that these, cat these spectral categories themselves related to one another and could not be considered to be independent unless you assumed an underlying factor called what they called P for psychopathology, an underlying factor that indicated how ill a person is. So this is their general vulnerability to illness that actually defined the likelihood that they would find themselves anywhere on this chart 
from one age to the next. It means that the likelihood that any of us will find ourselves in a clinical cluster, of any, any clinical cluster, is determined by our P-score, by how much psychopathology we have. Psychopathology doesn't sound like a very clear, what do we mean? We don't know what we mean. I will try and suggest to you an answer what it might mean, but we don't know. Now, we did a replication of this um, with a, uh, uh, a, a small sample, uh, but over a shorter period of time, of um, English children. Um, so this was a study of 23,477 children. It's, quite, it's a joke, it's an English joke, small sample, it's a big sample, never mind. <laughs> uh, but, you know, if you are from England, you make these jokes, you can't help it. It's, uh, anyway, so these are 11 to 14 year olds. And what we did was to give them a questionnaire uh, and then follow them up in um, three years' time to see which of them met criteria for clinical caseness. And what we looked at internalizing, externalizing, and these are just items from a questionnaire here that you can't see, but things like I am unhappy is an internalizing symptom and uh, um, uh, you know, very angry is an externalizing symptom. We did two kinds of analyses. In one analysis, we just looked at internalizing, externalizing, and in other analyses, we did what's called a bifactor model. So we assumed the presence of this general psychopathology factor. Now, what we found surprised us. So the two-factor model of internalizing, externalizing was actually quite helpful in predicting the future th three years down the line. Internalizing more or less doubled, the presence of an internalizing problem doubled the, future, the likelihood of future pathology, and externalizing problem quadrupled it, four times more likely. But what we found in the bifactor model, when we assumed a p-factor as well as internalizing and externalizing, that internalizing had very little prediction. Externalizing retained its prediction of factor four. But the likelihood that a child would have problems three years, or at lessened, three years later, was 10 times more likely if they had a high P-score. That's a big figure, 10 times. So what is happening here is that whatever that P-score is makes it more likely that you're vulnerable to catch another mental disorder three years later. Now, interestingly enough, this is not independent of personality disorder, because in an earlier study, we found that internalizing and externalizing uh, in uh, an adolescent sample, uh, and as well in an adult sample, actually both loaded on borderline personality disorder. So borderline personality disorder captured both internalizing and externalizing symptoms. Um, now, where this is, uh, becomes really interesting um, is how you capture this latent dimension. And in DSM-5, which I have mocked, uh, but there probably it was certainly an intent to capture it in the general criteria for personality disorder, the general criteria for personality disorder. Let me be most clear about this. So if you look at uh, uh, this bifactor model that assumes this general factor, in addition to specific personality disorders, you get a better fit. Let me show you what we did. Uh, in, in this study, there are all the different kinds of personality disorders, borderline, avoidant, obsessional, schizotypal, narcissistic, antisocial, and so on. And all these have a certain degree of internal coherence. So these are the criteria down here. 
and they correlate, suggest to some degree, suggesting that those personality disorder diagnoses are valid entities. But what we found overall, overall, this is an unacceptable model. Statistically, on these almost 1,000 people with personality disorder, this is not a good fit. Why not? Well, this will not surprise you. The reason why not is because these are highly correlated disorders. So borderline and avoidant is, uh, correlates 0.6. This, any, of, any clinician in the room will know this. When you look at this, what actually is happening, and this is really quite a fun graph, uh, <laughs> thank you, uh, 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 what, you, what you find here is that the symptoms cross load across uh, different diagnostic criteria. So the different diagnoses, the symptoms do not tell you which, di which personality disorder an individual has. What appears is uh, a number of factors which you can name, which you probably make sense, but it, here's is where it becomes interesting. The factors which provide an excellent model fit validate a number of the uh, personality disorders that we are used to as clinicians. So avoidant, obsessional, narcissistic, schizotypal, antisocial are all validated in this analysis. If you assume in this bifactor analysis that there is a general factor, that there is a P factor of personality disorder, are you with me? So there is something that's wrong with that person, that's generally wrong with them. Am I being clear about this? Should be surprising to some of you. I didn't know this before. But what I really didn't know is that borderline personality disorder doesn't have its own factor. Borderline personality disorder uniquely loads on this general factor. So what you have are individuals who meet some criteria of borderline personality disorder, also some other criteria of personality disorder, who actually are increase the chances of any personality disorder in that individual. So borderline personality disorder is, if you like, the prototypical personality disorder that a person can have. The story hasn't ended yet. Just to move one on one. This is a brilliant model fit. I won't bore you with that. But you come up with an, a structure for psychiatric diagnosis that's slightly different from what uh, we are used to in a dimension of impairment increasing up here, you have at the bottom end externalizing and internalizing conditions that are clear. As you move up this impairment parameter, two things change. One, it's no longer gendered so you no longer see the difference between men and women. Second, you increase the chances of persistence. You increase the likelihood of unsuccessful treatment. So what we really need to measure is the level of persistence. What is, so this is really the, the, the crux of the matter. What is this P factor? Now, at this point I want to uh, take a little sideways turn to talk about maltreatment. There are now epigenetic traces of maltreatment, and if I was going to suggest something for you guys to study in the context of uh, your brilliant uh, uh, system, is the epigenetic aspects of maltreatment. Because uh, we know that in terms of this general pre-factor, we know that maltreatment increases the risk of all kinds of mental disorder, any kind of mental disorder. And we also know that the methylation of certain genes is increased by uh, maltreatment. So 
glucocorticoid receptors uh, gene promoter is more methylated uh, in the brains of those who have experienced adversity and suicided. You have to wait for people to die to look at that, uh, unfortunately. Um, but there, is, there are now better techniques for, for looking at it, and those techniques will improve as we, as we go on. Um, but also uh, other locations uh, find uh, uh, similar effects. Uh, and there are, is indication that some inherited differences in specific genes may be moderated by the effects of adversity and determine who is resilient. And there's just one study that I uh, want to draw to your attention here, which is a study that we did um, uh, uh, some time ago, three years ago, um, where we looked at genetic predisposition in terms of a first degree relative of a young person who had a primary diagnosis of any disorder. So they had any disorder, doesn't matter what, but they had probably passed on the risk, the genes that puts an individual at risk of a uh, 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 P-factor score. Or it could be environmental, we wouldn't know. But what we looked at, it's a longitudinal study, so we looked at the extent to which those individuals had adversity in terms of, for example, uh, uh, maltreatment. Now, if they had no family history, in other words, low P-scores, assumed low P-scores, then maltreatment did not substantially increase the likelihood of a diagnosis of borderline personality disorder. But if they had family history, positive family history, even not in relatives who lived with them, then 42%, as opposed uh, to uh, less than 10%, 8% uh, of these individuals had, uh, if they had maltreatment, they also uh, had uh, indications of borderline personality disorder. In other words, a combination of maltreatment and a genetic risk uh, defined uh, the risk of borderline personality disorder. As I said, we don't have to talk about genetic risk, although that's the most likely explanation. But it doesn't have to be extreme environments. If, if you have a mum who talks about you at age five in a negative way, you're more likely, just a negative way that she talks about you, you're more likely to have a personality disorder uh, in your adolescence than if, you're, uh, if you have a family history um, of uh, uh, mental disorder than if you have no family history. If you have no family history, that increase of risk is far less. What is that hinting at? Well, there's a, a further fact in this study. The kids at age five who uh, later on were to develop personality disorder, had poorer theory of mind. They were poorer understand, they had poorer understanding of the mental states of others. And later on, they would have a personality disorder. So there's something here uh, about the P factor and social cognition and attachment. And this is really what I want to end on. So for those of you in the uh, audience who do not know what mentalizing is, I want to introduce the concept, which is very simply thinking about behavior in others and in oneself as explained by a mental state, such as a thought, a feeling, a wish, a belief, a desire. If I drop this, and you observe me dropping it, it, none of you had thought that that was by accident, I hope. Because you had a model of my mind as trying to demonstrate a stupid point. And this, this is a book uh, where this is all uh, written uh, in great detail, and uh, it's fairly recent. Uh, 
It's new and improved, and uh, it washes brains whiter, and it's longer than all previous versions. And there are only 2,000 copies left. So you better hurry. Um, the bottom line is uh, that mentalization-based approaches are actually quite helpful in treating borderline personality disorder. And also, there's going to be a conference on this in Geneva, which is not very relevant here, but uh, Martin Dabane, who's organizing the conference, would never forgive me if I didn't mention that there was a conference. What has given us um, some food uh, for comfort uh, is the massive increase in the, the citation of men the term mentalizing over recent years. As you can start it, this is the number of papers that have referred to mentalizing uh, over recent years. 2015 has some catching up to do, but we, I, th I think we'll catch up. And that encouraged us to look at uh, Google um, n-grams. And n-gram looks at um, uh, the uh, frequency which a word is used in the uh, English, uh, 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 in any uh, language, but it's 5.2 million books are scanned. And you'll see there very heartwarming is that in, certainly towards the end in 1990 onwards, this tremendous increase in mentalizing. Slightly more worrying there is, oops, uh, slightly more worrying is that in 1880s, which I wasn't around in the 1880s. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> I, uh, but there was this massive increase in mentalizing, in the word mentalizing in the 1880s. Um, and we wondered about what that was about. And um, uh, through serious scientific research undertaken by Dr. Lorenzini, um, uh, we found the answer to this being in headache, the study of headache and neuralgia. Uh, where amongst uh, one studies, uh, one of the studies, Hammond has conducted a series of careful urinal analyses for the purpose of ascertaining the changes in the composition of the urine incident on increased mentalization. From these experiments, he's led to draw the following conclusions, that increased mental exertion augments the quantity of urine. So there'll be a measure of how hard you were concentrating outside uh, in the restrooms. Um, uh, joke. <laughs> okay, but in, you know, basically, you you don't uh, uh, you you don't know that uh, you made uh, uh, made until it's only in the United States until you made it to Hollywood. I, I, we don't get, are you getting any sound? Do you ever look at someone and wonder what is going on inside their head? Did you guys pick up on that? Sure. Oh, it, something's wrong. We're going to find out what's happening, but we'll need support. It's maximum. Signal the husband. It's, it's. it's. Uh-oh, she's looking at us. What did she say? Well, oh, oh, sorry, sir. No one was listening. Garbage night? Uh, we left the toilet seat up. What? What is it, woman? What? Signal him again. Ah, so, Riley, how was school? Oh, you be kidding me. For this, we gave up that Brazilian helicopter pilot? School was great, all right? What was that? I thought you said we were gonna act casual. Riley, is everything okay? <sighs> Sir, she just rolled her eyes at us. All right, make a show of force. I don't want to have to put the foot down. No. Right. No. Well, so I, I'm sorry, I can't do anything about it, or the sound. Uh, it's not from here. Uh -huh. How was the first day of school? Anyway, it was fine, I guess. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's, it's quite a, a clever movie. Uh, leaving that aside, what they were doing there was mentalizing, which is balancing uh, different ways of thinking 
looking at intuitively and explicitly, uh, and this is what individuals with uh, personality disorder can't do well. They are impulsive as a consequence, and they do not appreciate uh, others' intentions. They get it, uh, get it wrong. They are very much uh, focused on the exterior, uh, looking at people, uh, facial expressions to try and see what uh, uh, they might be thinking. And uh, 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 this uh, makes them very poor, hypervigilant about other people's mental states. And they have an absence of uh, 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 knowledge of, of what they are thinking themselves or what uh, others are thinking. They are erring on the side of cognition um, or, of, or emotion rather than, and, uh, rather than cognition. And uh, 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 as a consequence, they are disorganized in their affect and they have show uh, uh, either they are clueless about cognitions or they treat it with the same seriousness, the same lack of doubt as uh, people treat um, uh, emotions. And finally, uh, the imbalance is shown in terms of uh, uh, differentiation of self and other. Uh, they are much more influenced by others' actions and others' mental states. Uh, they then uh, hypersensitive to that, and they lack uh, uh, serious knowledge about what they are thinking themselves. Um, I, uh, because of time, I don't have uh, 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 opportunity to kind of outline the theory in too much detail, but I do want to say that within our model, this is actually something that's established fairly early on in the context of the attachment relationship, and it actually reflects the quality of the attachment relationship. So if a parent is able to reflect on a child's uh, intentions uh, and doesn't overwhelm the child, then that child will develop better capacity to regulate their affect and the better capacity to reflect on mental states uh, in a range of situations. Um, basically, uh, attachment and mentalizing are, are loosely coupled, and uh, uh, it's really important to recognize that attachment, although is necessary uh, for uh, mentalizing, in itself actually doesn't necessarily uh, beneficial and you feel intensely about anything, increase, especially if you feel intensely about an attachment figure, we know from neuroimaging studies uh, that uh, your mentalizing actually uh, will be poorer. And if you just think about when you are in love, when you remember being in love, uh, maybe you are in love at the moment with someone, if you think about whether that person is socially trustworthy or not, it's hard to make a judgment about that when you feel in love with that person. It's, you are overwhelmed by the effect. Okay. Um, there is a, a vicious cycle here uh, between emotional arousal, the activation of uh, attachment strategies of avoidance, impairing mentalization, and the absence of resilience. Uh, and to, to finish, I want to extend this into a social context. I want to move beyond the attachment relationship. And I want to think with you about social adaptation. I want to think with you about social adaptation because we know that a disorder like depression or indeed personality disorder, including borderline personality disorder, are massively affected by the social conditions. So this graph indicates to you the gap between the richest and poorest 20% in any country and the prevalence of uh, uh, borderline personality disorder. So where the gap between the richest and poorest 20% is greatest, prevalence is also greatest. Where prevalence is lowest are also countries where the richest and poorest 20% in that society are closest together. Why am I mentioning that? I'm mentioning that because I'm wanting to suggest that we should uh, move away from uh, 
our current framework to a broader framework uh, of uh, uh, the way uh, we think about mental disorder. I want to suggest to you that um, we have actually been wrong in looking at things just in terms of sex and aggression. I started my career out looking for sex and aggression, but not, in my, not for myself, you understand, in my patients. Um, uh, then I changed my mind at 40 uh, when my children uh, came into the scene and I started being interested in attachment. And then at 60, I changed my mind again uh, and thought actually what was more important was communication. Uh, all this time, of course, I was supported by my family. Uh, that's my dad, that's my mom, that's my sister, that's me. Uh, that's me saying I want to write my PhD on the use of low signal to noise ratio stimuli for highlighting the functional differences between the two cerebral hemispheres. That's my dad saying you will never amount to anything if you hold a ball like that. <laughs> and that's my mum saying let the boy dream Ivan, he's a born dilettante. It's my sister, you look smug now but you will lose your hair just like dad. My relationship with her has not improved in the meantime. Anyway, um, uh, there is quite a lot of evidence that attachment is associated uh, with uh, borderline personality disorder. I don't really have time to go into that. Uh, what I do want to talk about um, is that the attachment research that we and others have done is culturally uh, very biased. It's culturally blind, it's socially oblivious, it misses different family configurations, uh, and empirically it's based on weird people. Where weird stands for Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. And that infanticide in Milan run at 30 to 40% in the uh, 19th century. Because historically, childhood was a state of enduring and murderous abuse and brutality. What I'm trying to get at here is that what we now consider normative may never have been normative and that actually the adaptation, the attachment style that we now think is most adaptive may actually only be adaptive in certain social environments. What I think is important um, is uh, to be to have modesty about uh, uh, attachment. This is when I believe that attachment answered everything. This is me now, uh, or not so long ago, feeling much less uh, confident, and that's partly because uh, I now believe that, along with an many anthropologists that attachment is not to do with security uh, of relationships. That is not the question that most parents ask us. The question that they are interested in is how can they ensure that their child knows whom to trust, how to share appropriate social connections to others. That that is the critical question um, from a, a, a social point of view that in the context of modern evolutionary theory, we should consider attachment as a, a signaling system, that the kind of environment that you're born into signals to you as an infant what you should expect from the world that you have going to be finding yourself in. What that means, and this is really serious, is that when we are coming across someone with a, a high B score, we are coming across a person who has had attachment experiences that told them, that signaled to them, that a particular style of social adaptation may be most useful, even if it causes them pain and causes others around them pain because it is what makes it most likely 
that their genes might contribute to the gene pool. They are hard to change. We find them challenging therapeutically because their genes tell them that they, what they are doing is the best possible thing for their survival. And I, by their survival, I don't mean necessarily their personal survival, but the survival of their genes for the next generation. And that low levels of mentalizing, much that I might think mentalizing is the best thing that you could, a person can do, that low level of mentalizing may indeed be a highly adaptive strategy for an individual who is living in a hostile environment. That hypersensitivity and rejection sensitivity, which we recognize as core symptoms of borderline personality disorder, may be absolutely essential if you are in a hostile social world. To have no faith in the authorities may be the best thing, the best attitude that you can have if you are in a particular kind of social environment. Families are charged by evolution to enculturate the children they look after to maximize the survival of that, those set of genes. So what we are, I think, most concerned about is what an individual child learns from the social environment that they find themselves in, which is primarily their family and their culture. And understanding that will help us understand why they behave the way they do, even if it's not a behavior that we find particularly acceptable. Mentalizing, the ability to understand mental states, is very helpful if you are in a collaborative social environment. If that social environment is actually lacking in that kind of social collaboration, then I would submit to you that our patients with comorbid depression and personality disorder are far better off to be mistrusting than to be able to extend trust to people who do not deserve that level of confidence. And with that, I wish this particular initiative the very best of luck. I shall look out for the productivity that I know all of you hope that the, this multidisciplinary group will bring to this important subject. I know that the scientists involved are all first class and uh, they, working together, have as good a chance as anyone to be able to deliver the next chapter in the study of the comorbid condition of personality disorder and depression. Thank you very much for your interest. We want to thank Professor Peter Fonagy who has given this uh, magistral lecture the role of mentalization on research and treatment of personality disorders and mood state. Before finishing this ceremony, we're going to invite the stage the associate researchers to the Millennium Institute for Research on Depression and Personality, who somehow are going to be in charge of leading the borderline research. I mean, that is going to
to perform during the next, within the next 10 years as it's been the commitment of the state of Chile. We invite the, to the stage Marianne Krauses, Maria Pia Santalices, Diego Cosmelli, Guillermo de la Parra, Juan Pablo Jiménez, Vania Martínez, Claudia Miranda, Carola Perez, Eugenio Rodríguez, Graciela Rojas, Luis Salazar, Jaime Silva, Pamela Folch, who cannot be with us today, and we also uh, greet a distance associate, Alin Katomisic and Claudio Martinez, who are in this moment in Germany representing MIDA in an academic scientific activity. They are the people in charge of researching, creating, and giving shape to this institute that is being inaugurated today. Les agradecemos la asistencia. We want to thank uh, to your attendance to this inauguration. Now we invite you to a cocktail outside of this room. Good evening. Thank you very much.